Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Anabios webinar. My name is Chris Mathis. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Anabios, and it's my pleasure to be the moderator for this session. Anabios has been uh, hosting these uh, webinars since October 2019. Uh, we kicked it off uh, with Patrick Doherty, and um, we've actually had 11. This will be our 12th pain webinar. Um, and we started even before the, the pandemic, and um, webinars became very popular. Um, obviously, during the pandemic, um, the opioid crisis has not gone away. In fact, um, the HEAL initiative says that it's getting worse. So um, these webinars, uh, this research is extremely important. So um, it's great to have everyone on the webinar today. And uh, before we get started, I want to do a, a couple of different things. Um, I'm going to um, introduce a, an audience poll as people come into the virtual conference room here. Um, there'll be four questions. Uh, we'll go through them very quickly, then I'll present the data at the end of the webinar. So the first question, do you work with human DRGs in your pain research? What are the barriers to working with human DRGs? Availability, quality, cost, all of the above or no barriers. And the same questions for human spinal cords. So uh, I'll get to those uh, just before uh, I introduce Dr. Drew. Uh, a couple of words about Anabios. Uh, many of you know us, uh, some of you don't. Uh, Anabios is a unique contract research organization and biotech company based in San Diego, California. We recover human tissue samples from ethically consented donors and use the tissue or cells to perform physiological assays in which we can test preclinical compounds for drug discovery projects. We have essentially redefined first in human. You can learn more about Anabios um, at www.anabios.com. Okay, so let's go to the poll. I'm going to launch the first question and give everyone a chance to answer this. So the first question, do you work with human DRGs in your pain research? Please select yes or no. I'll give everyone a second. It shouldn't take too long to think about that. All right, we're gonna to go to the next question. What are the barriers to working with human DRGs? I'll give you a little more time on this one. The, oh, let me launch it. There we go. Um, availability, B, quality, C, cost, D, all of the above, or E, no barriers. Uh, Antibios will use this research to, um, this data, to get more information um, about the, re the pain research field. Okay, the next question is uh, similar to the first question. And uh, do you work with human spinal cords in your pain research? Yes or no? I'll leave it up for a couple more seconds. And there we go. And the final question, what are the barriers to working with human spinal cords. And um, many of you may have heard that um, Anabios has uh, worked with Eli Lilly in the past year collaborating to de develop um, a human spinal cord assay. Uh, if you'd like more information about that or anything about Anabios, you can send me an email at cmathis at anabios.com. Okay, I'm going to close this. Stay tuned at the end of the webinar. Uh, just before Q&A, we will um, or I'll re share the results of that, those polls. So it's really my pleasure. And also uh, at the end of the webinar, we'll have time for a Q&A. You can find the question box at the bottom right-hand corner of your GoToMeeting um, tab. It's really my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Rob Giroux is Vice Chair for Research at Washington University Pain Center. Um, he has also a co-founder of a company, Neurolux, since 2015. Um, before that, he was um, he started his, his uh, career as a professor at Baylor College of Medicine in 1998 and did his PhD in neuroscience at Emory University. So the Jarrell Lab util utilizes a combination of behavioral studies, patch clamp electrophysiology, optogenetics, in vivo imaging, molecular and genetic approaches to understand the signaling pathways involved in nervous system plasticity that underlies pain sensitization. Their mission is to identify novel approaches to reverse this maladaptive plasticity to provide new therapeutic strategies to reduce pain and its impact on patient quality of life. Work in the lab also includes clinical science aimed at translating findings from the lab into new or improved therapies for patients with pain. And this is really the key of the HEAL initiative and, and NCAP. These studies include comparative studies 
of human physiology to preclinical models, as well as healthy human volunteers aimed at establishing proof of concept for novel analgesic therapies based on findings from the laboratory. So without further ado, um, I'll hand over the screen to Dr. Giroux, who will be presenting on translational pain research, targeting sensitization. There we go. Rob, take it away. Okay, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, nice to see a, a good turnout for today. Um, yeah, so uh, as Chris said, I'll be I'll be talking about our approach to translational pain research. Um, uh, he already mentioned uh, a little bit of my disclosures. None of these are really relevant other than the funding for today. Um, uh, the, the topic for today, as, as Chris mentioned, is, is uh, pain. Um, I think everybody probably is aware of the scope of this problem. Um, uh, these are some of the stats highlighted in a now 10 years old, hard to believe, uh, Institute of Medicine report <clears throat> on uh, relieving pain in America with tens of millions of Americans suffering from chronic pain with an immense uh, economic impact of over half a trillion dollars. So it's a huge clinical problem that is really not uh, addressed well by current therapies. And, you know, I think um, one of the things that we're all aware of is we, there has been uh, tremendous progress over the past, you know, 20, 25 years in understanding um, the sort of basic neuroscience of pain uh, and nociception. Um, a number of these key kind of, uh, you know, findings here, obviously lots of uh, new ion channels and, and responsible for pain transduction and transmission. Um, you know, we understand a lot more about the role of specific neuronal subtypes, um, identified both peripheral and central mechanisms of amplification in these pain pathways. And as I say, there are many of those uh, kind of mechanisms are potentially druggable in terms of developing new therapeutic modalities. Um, and there's been, um, uh, has had been considerable investment uh, in big pharma in chasing down uh, these potential targets, uh, but uh, to little avail. Uh, there are a couple of notable uh, advances, but there are also uh, uh, quite a few failures. So this is true, really, in in all neuroscience drug discovery. That a lot of things, you know, uh, die on the line somewhere along the way. But some notable failures have been things like the, you know, the NK1 antagonists and MDR receptor antagonists, et cetera, microglial inhibitors. And um, <clears throat> for a lot of these things, we have had really extensive preclinical data supporting mechanism. Um, in some of these cases, we had really, I think, excellent drug-like uh, compounds that uh, seemed to have good safety profiles and then uh, were uh, really rolled out in large uh, trials. <clears throat> and, but despite that, um, um, a lot of these have, have failed, as I mentioned. So um, a lot of finger pointing going on as to why, why all these things are, are not making it across this translational divide. Um, uh, some of those fingers are pointed at preclinical research, as uh, recently we've heard a lot about, you know, poor standards in experimental design, um, things, that the, things like the arrival guidelines are meant to address randomization, planning, re reproducibility uh, being the key. And the second is uh, really potentially just the lack of predictive value of animal models, and that's kind of a big part of what we'll, we'll talk about today. Um, on the other side is uh, that there are potentially problems with the clinical trials themselves. Um, maybe uh, inappropriate patient populations, um, you know, choosing a, a, a clinical endpoint based on need as opposed to what the, the, the preclinical evidence supports. Um, um, flawed trial design, poor target engagement, obviously kind of normal concerns. And uh, the other part of, of what uh, we'll talk about today is maybe we're just jumping to patients a little bit too quickly. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, as I said, those are the couple of areas that we'll talk about today. And one of the things I've kind of uh, been saying for a while now is maybe uh, uh, one of the biggest problems we have here is that mice are not small furry people, but there are actually fundamental differences in the biology of, of the rodent models that we use for a lot of our preclinical work and humans that prevents uh, uh, consistent effective translation from uh, our preclinical studies into clinical efficacy. So, um, the two kind of main problems that I'll address with my talk today is uh, the, these two points here. First of all, is that it's really hard to assess pain in rodents. Um, uh, we can assess nociception, we can assess uh, withdrawal thresholds and things like that, but fundamentally we ask different questions of mice that we do of people. 
Um, we do, you know, we look at, at sensitization endpoints in animals, and when we move to patients, we ask them on a scale of zero to ten, how much pain do you feel? Um, and secondly, uh, and I think there's an important point, is that those things that we can ask of rodents, things about sensitization, uh, uh, bear an unknown relationship to clinical or ongoing pain. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And the second big issue is that in, 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 in most cases, the relationship between the uh, function and physiology of, of the animal models is not well characterized. The relationship between these animal models and humans is not understood. <clears throat> so um, the past you know, decade or so, uh, our lab has really tried to take a different approach to really zero in on this translational interface. I kind of call it micro translation, but it is re re not just rushing to jump from these kind of uh, preclinical mouse models into a clinical trial, but really try to interrogate that interface. Like uh, how, do we, how do we really get from an animal model to a human and have a better predictive efficacy. Um, so, and the way we do that, addressing those two questions is, first of all, we try to align experimental endpoints in our preclinical studies with early stage clinical uh, investigation. And secondly, we've spent a lot of time performing comparative studies of mouse and human physiology. And I'll talk about these two approaches uh, in this talk today. So uh, pain is difficult to assess in animals. I kind of mentioned this briefly. So when we're asking patients, as I mentioned, what we ask them is on a scale of zero to 10, how much pain do you have from no pain to worst pain imaginable? Um, but uh, you can't really ask that of a mouse. You don't get much of a response. Um, um, there's, you know, people are trying to do this in different ways that we'll talk about today, but uh, fundamentally we can't ask that question of a mouse or a rat. What we do ask them is, how sensitive are they to heat? Like here's kind of one of the thermal plantar apparatus this, uh, uh, to, to measure heat sensitivity, hypersensitivity, heat sensitivity of, of the paw of a mouse or a rat. Uh, or if we want to look at mechanical sensitivity, of course, we use things like von Frey filaments, where we ask about uh, sensitivity to heat, touch, cold, et cetera. Um, and we know that those things become sensitized by things that cause uh, pain uh, in people, things like nerve injury, inflammation, et cetera. Um, and then we see if uh, you know a drug or a treatment of some sort can reverse that hypersensitivity. So, um, and that is not the same thing as asking how much pain do you have. So, how do we address this? Um, then we and the field. So, uh, one thing people try to do is try to do what I said is hard to do, which is ask mice how they feel. We people have tried a lot of things related to looking at naturalistic behaviors like wheel running, changes in gait, home cage activity. Uh, facial grimace and, and some of the key players who, piled it, who, who pioneered this work are, are listed here. Um, and um, then, of course, we can use things like uh, place preference or aversion assays where we can uh, ask whether a drug uh, uh, reduces aversion or uh, in, induces a preference uh, in the context of pain. Um, and so that's how we can align things on the animal study side with what we, closer to what we ask of, of humans. Um, in the case of uh, how do we do things more similarly in humans is we can do things uh, with experimental, uh, experimentally induced pain sensitization in humans. So uh, really trying to just repeat the exact same experiment. And, and we'll, I'll talk to you about examples of these both uh, today. So rather than going right to a, a, a clinical pain patient and asking them if the treatment makes them feel better, we'll induce an experimental to induce pain sensitization and do quantitative sensory testing, much like we did in the animals. <clears throat> so I mentioned these approaches to, to measuring heat sensitivity in, in rodents, and the way we can do that very similarly in humans is using one of these thermal uh, 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 testing devices like this Medoc kind of thermal probe here. So it's very similar to kind of uh, heating the paw. We can heat the forearm or the hand or the, or the leg of a human subject and look at the sensitization to heat. Uh, and similarly, we can actually use the same approach in humans for mechanical sensitivity using things like von Frey filaments. And again, ask whether sensitization uh, uh, can be reversed. So the question comes up, well, why are we looking at sensitization? Is, is that relevant to clinical pain at all? Um, and indeed, it is, it is relevant in that there is uh, evidence of sensitization in pain patients. So this is a study we did again about 10 years ago with Todd Schwett, who's a neurologist who was at, at WashU at the time. We looked at, at migraine patients 
and did quantitative sensory testing looking at heat and cold sensitivity. And um, we don't really need to go through the details in, in great detail here, but basically age and sex match control patients. And we looked at heat pain detection threshold and migraineurs, whether they had episodic or chronic migraine, uh, had lowered uh, heat pain detection thresholds. So they were hypersensitive to heat. And similarly, it's true uh, for cold. So they had uh, um, increased sensitivity to cold. And this was true both in kind of trigeminal distributions like the forehead, but also on the forearm, suggesting that they had a generalized sensitization phenomenon. Uh, this, so this is one pain population, uh, migraine patients. Other patients, that's true as well. Here's an, another study that we did uh, with Henry Lai, a urologist here at WashU. Um, looking at uh, patients with uh, bladder pain syndrome or interstitial cystitis and uh, looking at a pressure pain threshold applied to the suprapubic region of the abdomen and patients with bladder pain syndrome showed uh, increased uh, VAS rating to, press, to pressure applied to that region uh, compared to other urologic patients who were not uh, pain patients. So those patients, these patients do in fact show evidence of sensitization, this phenomenon that I'm saying that we, is what we study in animals. It's present in clinical uh, 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 pain populations and this kind of sensitization evidence in a lot of groups that you can uh, uh, measure using quantitative sensory testing, uh, as I mentioned here. <clears throat> so um, our, this kind of uh, generalized approach then would be uh, the first question is, does a treatment that reverses sensitization in an animal model of pain also reverse experimentally induced hypersensitivity in humans? So not a pain patient yet, but a, just a, a healthy volunteer, for example, where you can induce uh, sensitization um, and, and it's similar to what we've done in animals. And does the same kind of mechanism reverse that hypersensitivity? The second question then, if, if, if you're kind of following this translational line of investigation would be, does a drug that reverses that experimentally induced hypersensitivity also reduce that uh, sensitization that is evident in chronic pain patients that I just showed you, like the, the bladder pain patients or the migraine patients? So th that gets to whether this sensitization phenomenon that we induce experimentally is related to the kind of clinically associated uh, hypersensitivity. And then if those things kind of follow, that gives you kind of the translational bridge to ask the final question, which is, by the way, on a scale of zero to 10, does the, this treatment make you feel better? So trying to kind of um, really ask very direct questions about whether these sensitization mechanisms are uh, related to the clinical pain phenomenon at all, which would kind of tell us whether that's a, a, a reasonable approach to studying, uh, uh, to identifying mechanisms for treatment of chronic pain. <clears throat> So uh, I'll tell you a couple of uh, sort of vignettes today about these kind of translational approaches. All of them, uh, just based on my own interest, are around oral glutamate receptors. Um, glutamate receptors come in two main flavors. These are the ligand-gated ion channels, the AMPA, K8, and MDA receptors that mediate fast synaptic transmission. And the, the kind of focus of my lab for many years has been understanding metabotropic glutamate receptor signaling. These are G-protein coupled glutamate receptors that come in several different flavors, these group one receptors, MGLU1 and 5, which are GQ coupled, uh, you know, typically postsynaptic excitatory, um, uh, coupling through GQ, PLC, and downstream signaling pathways. The group two and group three receptors are typically presynaptic GI coupled receptors that regulate transmission uh, and, and excitability in a variety of ways. So MGLU2, 3, 4, 6, 7, and 8. <clears throat> um, and these are in these different groups based on, on pharmacology. Uh, um, and, and so two and three are very similar. Uh, the group three receptors over here are a little bit different. But all of them kind of uh, have these general signaling pathways. And we've been trying to understand the role of these receptors in um, uh, regulating nociception and maladaptive plasticity uh, for 25 years or so. And so um, <clears throat> It's notable that these receptors have been the subject of, of considerable drug development efforts. And so um, we're trying to provide the preclinical and translational evidence base to support the application of those drugs to the treatment of pain. I'll skip this slide. It's very dated and, and some of it's now incorrect <laughs> that we know. So this was a from a review that Mark Barney and I, I wrote back, at, gosh, I don't remember early, very early in the 2000s. But just suffice to say that that all these metabotropic glutamate receptors are expressed throughout the pain neuraxis uh, from DRG to uh, the brain and everywhere in between. <clears throat> um, okay, so the first thing we'll talk about 
um, using this kind of microtransaction approach is, is looking at MGLOR5 induced sensitization. Um, I'm not going to go into the uh, details on the on the uh, preclinical data set, um, just to say that here's uh, a series of papers that uh, just the ones from from my group uh, over the past 20 years or so that have identified uh, MGLOR5 dependent sensitization mechanisms at multiple sites in the pain neuraxis from peripheral nociceptors to the spinal cord dorsal horn, and we've had a lot of work going on in central nucleus of the amygdala, as many of you know as well. And um, um, uh, along with those kind of mechanisms of sensitization, we've shown that, we and many other people have shown that MGLOR5 antagonists have the ability to reduce this pain sensitization in inflammatory, neuropathic, and visceral pain models in, in both mice and rats. So a very strong sort of preclinical data set, uh, and again, not just by far, not just our lab, although those are the, the papers I show here, but many groups have, have uh, seen similar effects that really supported the notion that targeting MGLOR5 uh, would be a reasonable approach uh, uh, potentially to treat pain. So then the question is, does that translate to humans? Um, so we try to think about moving into uh, uh, preclinical or, or sort of translational studies in healthy volunteers, but this slide shows an exhaustive list of all the FDA-approved MGLOR5 antagonists. Um, uh, which is zero. And so that that kind of gets us to the point where I think a lot of us uh, uh, wind up in, in doing our uh, preclinical studies of pain, which we try to uh, develop a, a story that we think uh, supports the notion of a, a certain target, but then we're kind of stuck waiting uh, for uh, other, the handoff to uh, other people who can carry that into humans. But that, as I said, we're trying really hard to uh, approach this. So we, we're looking and, and we're sort of gifted this compound of Phenobam, which was uh, a drug that was actually developed in the 19, late 70s and early 80s um, um, as an, an anxiolytic, a non-benzodiazepine anxiolytic with an unknown mechanism of action. Um, it was shown to be safe and effective in the treatment of, of severe anxiety disorder with some notable caveats with those studies. Um, um, and uh, But nonetheless, it had patient safety data and, and in vivo efficacy data in humans. And then uh, in 2005, um, uh, Porter et al. from, from Hoffman La Roche, they were doing high throughput screens to identify MGLOR5 antagonists, and Phenobam uh, turned out in, the, in their chemical library to pop up as a, as a positive hit there. So. Here's a, a, a validated MGLOR5 antagonist that has patient safety data. So we thought, okay, let's let's dive in here and see if we can use this compound uh, to, to test this hypothesis in humans. We did some due diligence studies in mice to begin with. So here's uh, the effects of, uh, this is the formalin test in a mouse. You get spontaneous pain behaviors associated with a formalin injection. Uh, vehicle treated in the black circles. If you treat the animals, uh, pre-treat the animals with phenobam, you get a robust decrease in, in formal induced uh, pain behaviors. Uh, importantly, if we repeated that experiment in MGLOR5 knockout mice, um, you get a reduction just from the knockout, but uh, phenobam no longer has an analgesic effect on the residual pain behavior, um, suggesting that it's acting specifically on targeted MGLOR5, which was an important point because some of the, the clinically developed MGLOR5 uh, compounds had shown to have off-target action. Um, so this uh, left us feeling pretty good about the specificity of Phenobam. We tested it in a variety of pain models. Here's just CFA-induced thermal hypersensitivity. Uh, vehicle doesn't do anything. So reduction after CFA in the latency means they're hypersensitive to heat. Vehicle treatment does nothing, whereas Phenobam uh, causes a complete reversal of that. Um, <clears throat> so not just uh, formalin, but inflammation. We repeated, we did this study also in bladder pain. Um, this is basically a, a, a QST kind of, uh, a basically distension-induced bladder pain um, in, in mice. Uh, here, and you can see Phenobam substantially reduces the distension induced pain behavior in these mice. And again, um, um, uh, that's not present in MGLOR5 knockout mice. So it's, a, it's efficacious across uh, inflammatory and visceral pain as well as neuropathic pain. Uh, and further, um, a former postdoc of mine, Ben Kolber, uh, in his lab, carried this out <clears throat> looking further to ask whether uh, uh, Phenobam uh, can if that makes the mice show preference, so it doesn't make them feel better. So his lab did a spared nerve injury model of neuropathic pain and did a condition place preference and uh, assay. And what you can see is that uh, the mice prefer a chamber paired with phenobam compared to vehicle. 
when they have nerve injury, but there's no preference when without that nerve injury, suggesting that this uh, preference that develops is, is due to the relief of some aversive state that's induced by the nerve injury. So it makes them feel better. Uh, that is what we how we determine that. So kind of all the all the boxes ticked there, sort of the preclinical uh, side. Um, we know that this dr this drug, Finibound specifically, is effective in, in a variety of pain models, both reflexive and non-reflexive endpoints. It acts specifically by MGLUR5. Um, we did a bunch of kind of IND enabling type studies with that, looking at uh, blood chemistry and liver enzymes, et cetera. Uh, no, and, and those were all clean and there was no adverse events in a few human trials. And it had shown some CNS efficacy. So uh, we thought we would press on and, and test this in a human experimental pain model. Um, uh, uh, we were, I was very cavalier and naive about this. It actually took us six years to get from the point of being where we thought we were ready to uh, getting uh, a GMP uh, synthesis of Phenobam that and and uh, got the IND and IRB approval, et cetera. It took us a long time, but we set out to test this uh, in that kind of micro translation type approach, which is not to give it to a pain patient, but give it to a healthy volunteer and ask if experimentally induced sensitization reduces pain. And this is work that was spearheaded by Laura Cavalloni in my lab um, um, and was finally published last year. Um, this is just the, the pharmacokinetics uh, following an oral dose of Phenobam in healthy volunteers. And you can see nice dose dependent increases. Uh, also note the lack of error bars. That's because when I put the error bars on here, it's a mess. And that is because this drug has really uh, variable pharmacokinetics in across different uh, subjects, which is one of the reasons that it was sort of abandoned. But we can see kind of the time to peak plasma concentrations of phenomam, and that enabled us to do um, a heat capsaicin sensitization trial, uh, just to say that in the PK study, we had no uh, drug-related adverse events, which is good to know. But we uh, then decided to test this in humans using the, this heat capsaicin sensitization model, where basically you apply a capsaicin cream to the arm and, and heat the area of skin with a thermode that, that Medoc Thermo showed you. And then you, you measure using a foam brush or Von Frey filaments, the area of hypersensitivity that develops outside the area of this uh, uh, sensitiz uh, kind of sensitization by the thermo. And this has been shown previously to be kind of a, a way to look at potentially centrally acting uh, uh, analgesic drugs. And so this is the model that we tested. It's very similar to things that we can do in mice. We can in, induce either inject capsaicin or inflammatory mediators. We get heat hypersensitivity, tactile hypersensitivity that is reversed uh, robustly by Phenobam, as I showed you. And we did that here in humans. Um, uh, with the help of Karen Peterson uh, at UCSF, so thanks to Karen for helping us set that up. And so here's the here's the result basically, which is this is the area of sensitization on the forearm uh, that kind of uh, wanes over time after the sensitization that you see here. This is uh, the the subjects that were treated with placebo, and here you have the subjects that were treated with phenobam. And we did have. At the time of, of peak plasma concentration, there was one time point there where there's a significant, statistically significant reduction in that area of sensitization. Um, and uh, so some promise there, as I mentioned, there's really big challenges with Phenomam because of the variability in pharmacokinetics. And so that pre presented the challenge to us to actually really robustly testing this further and thinking about going into patients just because the effect size was kind of small and the pharmacokinetics were such, such a problem. Um, but uh, you know, we we carried this out as far as we could with this drug, uh, pharmacokinetics, this capsaicin induced sensitization, which sort of complete but rather unsatisfying, even though we did see a statistically significant reduction. And so we were wondering about you know things like can we correlate this analgesic efficacy with receptor occupancy, which we could do with PET studies, et cetera. Um, and then we would want to ultimately move forward into uh, patients uh, looking at their sensitization and then at their ongoing pain. But basically, we've we've sort of left this where it is and are awaiting a, a better drug that'll that'll have better uh, PK uh, and known relationship to receptor occupancy where we can test this. And I will just say that we uh, I do have an ongoing program uh, in collaboration with the, the uh, Warren Center for Drug Discovery at Vanderbilt University, Jeff Kahn, Craig Lindsley, and Jerry Rook. Uh, and our group have a, a HEAL initiative grant to develop these MGLU5 uh, antagonists. And hopefully within a, a, the next couple of years, we'll, we'll have much better drug where we can actually move this project forward. <clears throat> um, 
Okay, so that, that's kind of this aligning preclinical uh, and early clinical studies approach. The next thing I'll talk about is moving into uh, thing, something kind of near and dear to, to antibios and, and, and many of us in the community, which is using comparative studies of mouse and human physiology uh, at the cellular level as a way to uh, lower this translational barrier. And uh, this work uh, started um, uh, quite a while ago now um, uh, through a chance meeting uh, between myself and Andre Getty uh, at Antibios uh, at a New York Academy of Sciences meeting. Um, uh, Andre and I were, were longtime friends. We were postdocs together, uh, uh, more on that at the end of the talk. But, um, and uh, I learned about his company and the fact that they were, they were starting to use, uh, get access to human dorsal root ganglia. And, and we, uh, on the spot, uh, formed a plan to kind of uh, move ahead to do these comparative physiology studies. So big thanks to, to Andre and, uh, and his whole team there uh, and helping us get this off the ground. And so we worked with Antibios for several years and had a couple of uh, publications with them, uh, kind of the early stages of, of uh, uh, characterizing the physiology of human DRG neurons and looking at sensitization. I'll show you some of those data in a second. And subsequently, um, we <clears throat> worked on getting our own pipeline for acquisition of tissue set up locally here at WashU uh, in partnership with uh, Mid-America Transplant, um, a local organ procurement organization. Um, um, of course, of early studies we did and continue to do some work with Antibios, and of course, there's also tissue available from NDRI, and I encourage everybody to look at all those. I just put this uh, this uh, publication here, this Volcheval Nature Protocols paper from 2016, where we really uh, talked about how we made this kind of work with our local organ procurement team, um, and so I'll point you to that direction if you want to see the detailed protocol on how we acquire uh, the DRGs and, and do the culture from uh, from organ donors. Um, and so this is one uh, one approach is partnering with the organ procurement organizations. The other approach that we're using and several other groups have used, um, especially Pat Doherty has been doing a lot of work with this at, at uh, MD Anderson, uh, using surgically resected materials, things like ganglionectomy or, or that are, that are performed in a variety of things with uh, spinal fusion surgeries or where you have uh, things like pain resulting from compression fractures associated with uh, metastatic disease. So you can get access to surgically resected materials or using, as I said up here, the donor tissue from transplant service. Um, yeah, so uh, here we go on comparative uh, studies with mouse and human. So we'll stick with the MGLR5 story for a minute. Um, um, oh, I jumped ahead of myself there a little bit, just to say that you, when you get these the the dorsal root ganglia, you can you can use them for a variety of things. Uh, this paper described you know just looking at the uh, using calcium imaging and electrophysiology to look at the properties, so you get nice typical responses to things like peritogens and algogens, things like histamine, chloroquine, capsaicin, mustard oil, uh, etc. Um, just like you would see in a mouse dorsal root ganglia, and you can do nice uh, patch clamp recordings on these. Um, as well, and so uh, the variety of different uh, uh, things you can do. These uh, the human DRG neurons have a, a, a large, largely <laughs> are no susceptors. They respond to all these uh, things like inflammatory mediators. For here's an example of direct activation and sensitization by things like uh, bradykinin and prostaglandin E2. Um, this is in the original paper we, we characterized this. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, you know, the, using these these neurons from organ donors, you can put either either use the the ganglia directly for histology, or you can put them in culture and suitable for things like you know phys physiology, imaging, uh, sequencing, uh, anatomy, etc. So um, now uh, with that platform established, um, and again, this is basically what Anabios was pioneering many years ago is. Uh, can we use these to, to assess whether novel analgesic targets identified in mouse and rat translate directly to humans with the, that first in human being in this, the sensory neuron? Um, so again, sticking with the MGLOR5 story, um, some things you need to know. Uh, are, is the gene of interest that you've been studying in a mouse or a rat expressed in the same cell populations in humans as it was in the rodents? And then are the effects of the activation of that target the same in a human neuron as it in the mouse neuron, because you could still have expression in the neurons, but maybe they don't have the same functional coupling, et cetera. So those are both important questions. And um, um, I'll just point out that a subset of those studies that we had done on MGLOR5 were actually looking at uh, MGLOR5 expressed peripherally in the sensory neuron nerve endings. This is a paper from back in 2001, a collaboration with Sue Carlton's lab, where we show that MGLOR5 is expressed 
uh, uh, in the uh, kind of unmyelinated nerve bundles, these feedback bundles uh, here in the, at the dermal epidermal junction in a mouse. And if you activate MGLR5, you get hypersensitivity to heat, you get potentiation of capsaicin responses uh, by the MGLR5 agonist DHPG and mouse sensory neurons. <clears throat> and this really led us to consider the idea that we could develop peripherally restricted MGLR5 antagonists as a way to provide analgesia without uh, any potential CNS side effects. And so um, once we started getting uh, human DRG, we, we were doing some RNA sequencing um, uh, work of our own, but also the, what I'm showing you here is just uh, the RNA data from bulk DRG sequencing in uh, Ted Price's uh, uh, sensory omics uh, data set. And so this is RNA-seq data, just looking at the relative abundance of the mRNA. These are all the mGLORs, mGLOR1 through 8. And you can see uh, in the mouse, here's the, the RNA expression level, relatively low, especially for mGLOR5 here. mGLOR6 is not expressed at all because it's mostly specific to the retina. But if we then compared this uh, as a first step, just like is, is our receptor expressed in the same cells, uh, when you look at the human, which is shown here in red, uh, there are some notable similarities in some of these genes, but if you look at mGLOR5, it's just not expressed at all in the human DRG, um, which was uh, a shocker uh, and uh, uh, really set us back. Well, it didn't just set us back. It, it led to the demise of our peripherally restricted mGLOR5 program and, and 15 years worth of, of NINDS funding that had supported us looking at this target. Um, <clears throat> but uh, certainly an important piece of information to have if you're thinking about uh, the translational utility of, of this target that we had spent a lot of time studying in, in mice and rats and suggested we should really be spending our time someplace else. Um, a parallel study that we're doing, okay, I mentioned with those are the group one receptors, which are excitatory. The group two receptors uh, and group three receptors are GI coupled and inhibitory. And it turns out that um, um, these group two receptors are also expressed uh, in the periphery in dorsal ganglion neurons. And we had a number of studies, again, <clears throat> that we had conducted, um, largely pioneered by Donya Yang and Santina Chiecchio uh, in my group over a few years, um, showing that MGLR2 agonists uh, can reduce sensitization in a variety of pain models, again, inflammatory, neuropathic, and visceral. And um, an interesting finding that we had was that in, it seems like endogenous activation of MGLR2 is, is part of the normal uh, recovery from inflammation-induced uh, hypersensitivity. <laughs> so, um, again, we felt like we had a pretty good preclinical set here, and with the, our findings from mGLOR5, we were a little anxious to know about mGLOR2. Uh, here we are back to the mRNA data again. Here's all the, the mouse uh, receptors. Here's mGLOR5, mGLOR2 over here. Um, when we look at the human, at least, uh, at least there's a decent, uh, although, re again, relatively low expression level, but some mGLR2 mRNA, at least expressed in the human DRG, suggesting that um, that target might be worth pursuing a little further, which we did. <clears throat> and so we went ahead and did some things looking at uh, trying to do immunohistochemistry. Um, uh, by the way, doing immunofluorescence in human DRG is really hard because there's a ton of autofluorescence, um, um, and some people are finding ways to get around that, but we just used this DAB product here, and <clears throat> we could see nice expression of mglr 2 in cell bodies and actually out in the in the axons uh, leaving the DRGs uh, as well. <clears throat> um, uh, we see that in human and mouse. Um, and <clears throat> we went ahead to repeat some of the studies that we had done uh, in, in mice and human DRG neurons. And, and basically what we did is we showed that if you if you apply PGE2 to the human DRG, DRG, DRGs, you get sensitization. So black is before and blue is after application of the inflammatory mediator PGE2. It basically, it causes a decrease in rheobase and increased firing frequency. And um, uh, this blue and red here is showing the uh, decrease in rheobase associated with prostaglandin E2, which is significantly uh, uh, reduced by uh, NMGLR2 agonist APDC. And so this basically just went on to show that that, that measure of cellular sensitization uh, that we saw uh, reversed by NMGLR2 in, in mice is also conserved in humans. On, on the, uh, um, let's go on to the next one. So on the flip side of that, another another aspect of sensitization that we were looking at in mice back in the day was sensitization of capsaicin responses. So this experiment is giving a couple of capsaicin responses here. And then in between there, we can apply PGE2 uh, 
uh, to sensitize that. And you can see that the second response, which is normally desensitized, is potentiated here. And in mice, um, that effect uh, is reversed by, by blocking MGLR2, so you prevent this sensitization. You can see this smaller second capsaicin response here uh, following APC, APDC. So unlike what we saw with the electrophysiology, when repeated this, this in human DRG neurons, <clears throat> so this is the effect of, of uh, PGE2 uh, on the response uh, magnitude of that second capsaicin response, reversed by APDC in, in mice. But if you repeat that in humans, there's absolutely no effect of MGLR2 activation on the TRIP-V1 sensitization. Um, so that's uh, different than what we saw with the electrophysiological uh, uh, effects on excitability. So um, in kind of the, terms of the, that translational story is that we see similar uh, mechanisms of sensitization uh, uh, of sensory neurons in humans and mice by the inflammatory mediator PGE2. And we see that MGLR2 is expressed in both mouse and human DRG, but at lower levels in human. And that MGLR2 activation reverses sensitization of excitability, but not potentiation of trip v one responses. So <clears throat> some of those similarities, but notable differences suggest that maybe a cautious approach in, in the types of applications that a peripherally restricted MGLR2 might, uh, agonist might have for the treatment of pain in humans. So some notable, notable differences there. <clears throat> So I think what we can say from that is that these, you know, I, I, I still believe that, you know, animal models offer a really valuable resource for understanding basic neurobiological mechanisms of nociception and pain uh, for identifying potential candidate mechanisms and for the development of new treatments. <laughs> but, you know, we have to have an appropriate grain of salt um, and there need to be um, I try to uh, describe, you know, what I think are important differences in the way we assess pain in, in mice and humans, and we need to try to align those better. And I think a lot of people are making good progress there and, and doing that uh, much more today. We're all a little more aware of that. And finally, I think, you know, uh, that studies of human tissues are invaluable in helping to prioritize uh, potential therapeutic targets. And as I showed, like with MGLR2, potentially refining the targeting strategy for how you might use these uh, in humans. So MGLR2, you might think of a, a smaller kind of range of potential analgesic efficacy in human than what you might have thought from the mice. And for the case of MGLR5, um, while in mice, we would have potentially thought, hey, we should be targeting not just central, but also peripheral MGLR2, or maybe specifically peripheral, I'm sorry, MGLR5, but rather um, the data we have from human DRG suggests that, in fact, we, sh we, should, uh, we will need to be targeting central MGLR5 if we're going to have analgesic efficacy in humans. So I think, you know, centrally active MGLR5 antagonists and, and MGLR2 agonists, whether uh, systemically active or peripherally restricted, have, have some promise as potential therapeutic targets going forward. <clears throat> um, just looking at my time here. Okay, good. So, um, ongoing other human uh, tissue studies that we have, um, you know, it's kind of started as a, a this collaboration with Anabios and then kind of a little, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, kind of single shop operation in our lab. But over the past few years, this has really started to expand and, and we've been collaborating pretty widely. Notably, we have substantial collaborations with Ted Price's lab at UT Dallas. Um, uh, one of the most uh, more recent papers that I think uh, this group might find of interest is this one at the top that we published in Pain, led by Andy Wang Chu in Ted's lab and uh, Lisa McCovery in, in my lab, which was comparing um, mouse and human DRG from intact DRG versus dissociated cultured cells to see, uh, you know, how how close are they to begin with, and then after you dissociate them. Uh, what what do we learn about you know transcriptional reprogramming and things like that and and there are not surprisingly considerable changes uh, associated not just between mouse and human but with the dissociation and and culturing of these neurons and the cultured neurons have a notable injury kind of phenotype that I think is is relevant um, but largely supports the use of <clears throat> these uh, cultured neurons for uh, uh, thinking about uh, pharmacologic targets for uh, drug development for pain. I'll also point you, um, other, other things that we have going on in the lab, uh, kind of listed below. Uh, we've been doing ongoing work on single cell transcriptomics of DRG that, again, was largely an, in collaboration with Ted. Um, Alex Chemessian in my lab has been working on this. He also has a project on spinal cord. That's all ongoing, but uh, also a recent uh, preprint I'd like to point this group to, which is 
uh, again, this is really Ted's work. Uh, we, we just kind of helped him with some of getting some of this up and running, but uh, a really nice study from uh, uh, Diana. Uh, oh, sorry, I uh, misspelled your last name there. <laughs> so, so, using spatial transcriptomics with the Visium platform, uh, looking at human nociceptors, really, really interesting work coming out there. That's that's uh, uh, archived uh, uh, with a preprint there, but uh, uh, under review um, now. So. Also been uh, led by Brian Kopitz, uh, formerly my lab, now his own lab at WashU, uh, looking at spinal cord physiology uh, that he started a few years ago. Um, um, seen some nice work from Mike Hildebrand's lab and Henry Dedek uh, in that group uh, showing spinal cord patch clamping, and we've been doing a little bit of that in our group as well. And uh, really kind of uh, carrying on the, the comparative physiology and, and looking at maladaptive plasticity or homeostatic mechanism plasticity in DRG and spinal cord, uh, a new uh, project for John Delrisari in the lab that was really started by uh, uh, Melanie Puyan and, and carried on by uh, Lisa McCovert when she was in the lab, and John's going to kind of carry that mantle forward. So uh, lots of comparative physiology, trying to establish uh, baseline data sets for people to understand similarities and differences in gene expression in humans. And I, I just highlight that there's an absolute ton of work to do. And it's a lot of this is very expensive work to do. And um, uh, I think, uh, you know, Ted and I have uh, been working a lot together over the past few years on this. And I think we've really found that collaboration is the way on this. Um, and you can see uh, that uh, across a lot of labs. And I think uh, we're certainly game to, to work with people and help others get things set up. But there's there's much to do and, and the tissue is is relatively scarce. So we need to pool resources to make the best use of that as possible. Uh, at the end, I'll just go back to say mice are not little people, uh, so we shouldn't pretend they are in, in uh, carrying out our uh, preclinical pain research. Really keep our eye on the prize here, which is that uh, we need to understand the relationship to humans so that we can really maximize our efficacy and effectiveness in, in uh, developing new pain therapeutics. A little blast from the past here. My first thank you is going to be to my longtime friend and colleague, this guy right here, Andre Getty. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse or not, but uh, this is the, uh, the the molecular neurobiology lab at the Salk Institute back in the 1900s. Uh, Steve Heineman and Chuck Stevens, who are the PIs. Uh, here I am looking like I'm 12 years old. But Andre and I met um, a long time ago um, and had a, a good time as postdocs, but really um, have uh, had a really interesting and productive uh, uh, collaborative work on the human tissue platform, which, uh, uh, again, pioneered by Anabios. Um, finally, uh, I'll thank uh, the, the funding agencies, you know, that have supported a lot of this work. I, I really want to thank uh, Anabios, but also Mid America Transplant, the team there, and uh, the, the donor families who are, are willing to to help uh, move science forward <coughs> um, uh, with very generous uh, gifts <coughs> of their tissues. And um, the members of my current members of my lab here in yellow, and and a lot of those folks are involved currently. And the, the this uh, white column is members from the past who are, contributed to the day that I showed today. Um, I want to thank um, my former colleagues at WashU, Evan Karish and Todd Schwett, who helped with a lot of the translational work. Again, Anna Bios, uh, big thanks for helping us get this off the ground on our human tissue. Andre, I mentioned Paul Miller, Guy Page, uh, and others who have worked with us on projects of the year. Again, highlighting uh, Ted Price's lab at UT Dallas, where we have pretty strong ongoing collaborations. Um, uh, people who we've directly collaborated with a lot, Pradeepta, Stephanie, Diana, and Andy. Oh, and I misspelled Andy's name as well. <laughs> I've oh, for two on, on uh, spelling Price Lab members' names here. Andy with an I, Wangju, so thank you. And Karen Peterson at, at, at UCSF. So that's, I'll close there and uh, uh, turn it back over uh, to the hosts. So. Rob, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. I really liked what you said about collaboration. It definitely takes a village and, and such an important um, project uh, like pain research and, and uh, being victorious in the opioid crisis. So we have time for questions. Uh, those of you in the audience, um, you can enter your questions in the panel, in the questions panel. And uh, before we do that, I, I promise to show the results of the poll, so I will do that. Um, and I also want to mention that um, we have some handouts available for download just below the questions panel. Um, you will see um, uh, one handout that's available about our human DRGs and antibios and another about the, the spinal cords. So let's take a look at the results from the poll. Um, the first 
question was, do you work with human DRGs in your pain research? Uh, I was very interested to, to see that um, the results showed that um, less than half do, and 39% um, uh, said yes. And so the next question, let me just go back to this. Uh, maybe that will change after today. Um, what is the what are the barriers uh, to working with with DRGs? 23% um, said availability. 56% uh, all of the above. Um, only 4% said no barriers. So um, definitely, as far as availability, um, uh, consider working with antibiotics. We do provide human uh, DRG samples, um, and we know they're high quality because we do physiology experiments with them. And, and spinal cords, as uh, Rob mentioned in his presentation, um, something that uh, Mike Hildebrand has talked about in a webinar uh, previously this uh, last year. 82% uh, said no. 18% um, said yes. And finally, what are the what are the barriers in spinal cord research? So 22% uh, said availability. 61% all of the above. Again, antibios um, is an important source for human spinal cords. So um, now let's go to the questions. Um, here we go. So, Rob, this was a, a question from the early part of your presentation. Uh, isn't the numeric rating from humans also not a very objective rating system? I 100% I agree. I mean, uh, that's basically what we're stuck with, right? I mean, pain is what what people say it is. I mean, um, absent uh, some sort of biomarker, but um, you know, I, I think the challenge with pain biomarkers even is how do you validate them? Ultimately, you're gonna you, the way you validate it is <laughs> has to be against what the patient says in terms of how much pain they have. You, you, right. So, how, how do you argue with someone when they say they have a lot of pain? I yeah. think that the zero to ten, you know, people. You know, everybody's ten is different, right? That's the thing, and people's mm -hmm. ten will 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 shift over time. <laughs> you know, you can see, have someone, yeah. for example, I've I've been in a room with patients, and yet the, they've been asked about their scale of their pain scale on zero to ten, and they say I'm a nine, and I can't imagine like in when I'm thinking about that scale, like nine, you should be, you know, right, uh, and they're sitting calmly, right? So I, it's it's a challenge. Right, right. It's the best we have, yeah. and I think the 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 way to think about the the numerical pain scale is like within subject over time, I think it's more reliable. So changes in people's individuals rating uh, over time is is useful. I think that the challenge is not everybody's 10 is not everybody, everybody else's 10. So. Right, and the physiology is different uh, between yeah. patients too. That makes it even more complicated. Yeah. Um, so does that apparatus allow also for testing cold sensitivity? I assume you're talking about the thermode, um, and yes, those yeah. devices do allow uh, it's Peltier controlled device, so you can do heat and cold. And in fact, when I when I showed the migraine patient data that we had collected, that was the same device, uh, uh, just set to cold temperatures, ramping cold versus ramping heat to detect heat and cold pain detection thresholds. Okay, there's a question from Cheryl Stuckey, who was one of our webinar speakers last year. Says Rob, you mentioned that human DRG neurons are largely nociceptors. Is that because the nociceptors survive the culture process more than non-nociceptors, which may be large diameter, or do you think that there are, in fact, more bona fide nociceptors in humans than we detect in mice or rats? And she said, "Great, great talk." Thanks, Cheryl. A good question. I think you know um, you might have imagined from doing if we're doing single cell kind of looking at cultured neurons that that would be an issue. But if you look at the, uh, the spatial data, especially from Ted's paper that they're put on BioArchive, there, there, there are big differences between mice and humans in terms of sort of the relative proportions. It, I mean, it depends on how you define a nociceptor too, but that's you know, based on gene expression markers and looking at trip one expression, for example, that it seems like a larger proportion of, of the of the cell of the DRG neurons are nociceptors in humans. I'll defer to Ted on that, but also defer to that bioarchive preprint that I put up there and have a look at that for yourself. Thanks, Rob. Um, another question from the audience. You mentioned bulk seq. Have you tried single cell sequencing in human DRGs? <clears throat> yes, yes, um, we have. Um, I mentioned at the end that's work that um, uh, Alex Tremessian's been doing in our lab and, and Ted's been trying this. I know uh, Steve Davidson has been doing some of this with uh, uh, 
Nick Reba at NIH as well. And so it's a challenge, like single cell is a real challenge just because of the difficulty of getting DRG neurons isolated. Um, the approach that we've been using is, is uh, single nucleus sequencing, which can be a little bit uh, easier, but still problematic and, and can be hard to get neurons. I think, again, this is one of the things we've been trying to talk across different groups and, and you know, kind of compare best practices and see what's working well. Will Renthal's been doing some of this as well. Um, so uh, a lot of us are talking about this right now. Single cell is very difficult. Single nucleus is, is a little easier, but still challenging. Definitely. Uh, here's a question from your collaborator, Ted Price. Um, what are your thoughts on type 3 mGLUs as an analgesic target? They seem to have a higher, at least similar expression in humans to what is shown in mice. Uh, yes, I am. I'm very keen on those group 3 mGLARs because the, the single cell data <laughs> Uh, and the bulk data really jump off the page at you, and so that is that is something that we're we're keen on and, and are looking at now uh, as well. Um, um, yeah, Vicky Vicky Brings in my lab has a, a project kind of looking at, at that, and we're we're really thinking about those because because the expression is just so high. Um, it really, right, really right. needs to yeah again letting this letting the 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 human data point the way, um, and tr then trying to compare back. You know, in, in a way, using the human data to say, are the mice or rats even a good model to study this? That's kind of the first question we're looking at. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I think more groups are going to start with the uh, human DRGs early on. Um, uh, so another question, in the case of mglu 2 agonists and PAMs, there are multiple published clinical trials, phase one to two. Where were any measures of pain reported? None that I saw. Um, I have looked, I've asked. Um, um, and I don't think that there are any measures of pain. If there are, I've missed it. Okay. But I think, you know, hopefully um, the, those those compounds that are out there in trials represent tool compounds that would allow us to, you know, I'd be, in, I'd be very interested to try that, for example, in, in that heat capsaicin sensitization model, um, except that I just showed you that that the mglu 2 agonists don't reverse sensitization of trp one in humans, whereas they did in mice. So that's- uh, Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. It's another question. What is uh, your perspective on the differences between spontaneous and induced pain uh, in in vitro or in vivo models and how this might impact translation? Yeah, spontaneous and induced pain. That is like, you know, I kind of had that slide at the beginning about this stepwise process that we go through, like, um, well, I mean, even induced pain. So the induced pain that we measure is, uh, you know, withdrawal to heat, cold touch. Um, um, I guess you can say form one is induced pain as well. But, you know, the mostly, it, it's, it's a challenge to think about what's actually causing pain in chronic pain patients. So what is spontaneous pain? Well, there's still probably a driver there, right? I mean, whether it's, you know, if you got low back pain, whether it's like postural adjustments that are causing mechanical stimulation of sensitized pathways, or even frankly the extent to which um, uh, mild tissue acidification or even or even body temperature can wind up causing activation of nociceptive pathways when they're sensitized. So, but 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 ultimately, patients. Well, well, there are there are some patients who complain about, uh, notably, for example, hypersensitivity to cold and. Uh, you know, dynamic tactile alveolar. Right. Those those are really really relevant for certain types of neuropathic pain. But a lot of the pain that, that people uh, uh, that we deal with in terms of population is what we I think the 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 questioner would say was spontaneous pain. I think it's really important for us to try to assess <coughs> pain, uh, pain with non-evoked measures in animals because I think that that is getting to Kind of a higher level processing that um, uh, these kind of peripheral sensitization measures <clears throat> might not get to. And frankly, there is some data coming from some trials that Simone Heratunian here at WashU has some data, for example, where it seems like you can start to uncouple um, effects on sensitization from clinical pain. And I think that's going to be a really important uh, uh, body of work over the next uh, few years to really look using kind of clinical studies that in incorporate quantitative sensory testing as well as measures of ongoing pain that allow us to say, should we be looking at this kind of sensitization to evoke stimuli at all? Um, or right. do we need to, you know, abandon that if, if the goal is to is to understand clinical pain? I guess yeah. the other part of that question was something about in vitro versus in vivo. Can you 
What was that again? I I, I can't remember what. Yeah. That was. <laughs> um. It, it said, "What is your perspective on the difference between spontaneous and induced pain in in vitro or in vivo models?" So it's just referring to both types of models. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. I think um, you addressed that. Yeah. Yeah, I think you know the in vitro stuff, um, um, as as uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, at least the human cells let you rethink what the first in human is. Mm -hmm. If you can test these in in cellular models, and things things at least translate at that level, it gives you a little bit greater confidence in moving into the pay, to the in vivo. Mm -hmm. But yeah. all, ultimately, it's the in vivo that matters. The question is whether those in vitro models will allow us to get a lot more high throughput screen and et cetera. Yeah. Right. It's also interesting in the in vitro models, you can actually get dosing information that can uh, apply to um, first in human studies. So a lot of great questions from the audience. I'll go through a few more. Um, Rob, you're able to stay for a few more minutes? Yes. So um, you mentioned that people with chronic pain exhibit global sensitivity to pain, migraine or IC patients sensitive to hot or cold. Does this suggest some systemic mechanism like global inflammation? Yeah, what is, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, global information is certainly possible. Um, I get my bias, my, my whole approach to this is that the global sensitization is is reflecting central sensitization in the in the kind of maladaptive neuronal plasticity sense. So that there, you know, my idea is that there are CNS amplifiers that, that cause that sensitization, but certainly it's possible that uh, there are peripheral mechanisms that, that drive this sensitization and the clinical pain syndrome is reflected by where that sensitization um, just reveals itself in terms of, of the, the clinical pain syndrome that that individual has. So for one person, you know, that that global inflammation that the questioner kind of mentioned could, could result in migraine headache due to some other kind of susceptibility in one population, whereas it could lead to bladder pain in a different person. It's a good question. I don't, yeah. We don't really know that. Yeah, I find that fascinating too. Uh, here's an interesting question. What are your thoughts on human iPSC sensory neurons used in drug discovery and, and translating that to human DRG testing? Yeah, it's it's a really potentially really important. I think I think the iPSCs are are super valuable, especially in the case where you have things like monogenically uh, inherited pain syndromes, where you can really study the effects of that mutation. <laughs> the future of, of those iPSCs, I think, again, to back to my point where we all need to work together on this is we really need to get data on the full kind of, you know, population level transcriptomics information uh, on what are the human sensory neuron populations and then compare that transcriptomic level data to the uh, iPSC derived uh, sensory neurons and kind of optimize those protocols to get the most, you know, accurate Exp you know, expression of of what a human neuron is, like a native human sensory neuron. Right. So I think that there's a lot to be learned from uh, knowing what what iPSC derived lines we have now and how we can tweak those mm -hmm. to get them to be much more aligned with the native human DRGs. That's where the real power will right. come. But certainly, there's a lot that can be done now with the lines that we have. It just depends on what your screen is. Like there's, you can imagine think, just yeah. being interested in axon op, ac you know like axon degeneration type stuff, and you can use those as good screens because right. a lot of the same things are there. But ultimately, um, I think using them as a screening tool and then validating with native cells is, is a really powerful way to go. Yeah, I think the challenge there is to make um, a variety of different cells. You know, our cultures have up to 25 different types of DRG neurons, and how do you repl replicate that in the in the stem cell system or make some kind of organoid? That's, that's challenging. Yep. Uh, we'll do a couple more questions. Here's one from Mike Hildebrand, who gave a great talk on uh, spinal cord prep last year. He said, fabulous talk, and I love your microtranslation approach. For your preclinical and early clinical studies involving mGlur5 and mGlur2, have you investigated whether mechanisms and pain outcomes are conserved or diverged between males and females? <laughs> yeah, great question, Mike. And and we have we have not done that extensively. We do have males and females in all of our studies now. <laughs> a lot of the, the early work we did, like where a lot of people was all in males for no good reason at all. <laughs> um, um, but uh, all the work we're doing now is in males and females. And um, most of like what we're seeing with mglr 5 is is that 
the analgesic mechanisms that are conserved, at least in the behavioral level. There, there are differences between the males and females that you see, but we still see analgesic effects in, in both um, for, for those. We haven't, we haven't done really detailed comparison, but we do include both. Uh, uh, so that's, you know, um, like a lot of the MGLR2 work I showed you <clears throat> was um, from quite a while ago. Um, and so with the new, new generation of MGLR2 drugs that are coming up, uh, that were mentioned by one of the other audience members earlier. We'll mm -hmm. definitely be doing those and comparing directly for males and females. But at the cellular level, we use yeah. we use both and haven't really seen any differences. But you know, depends yeah. on what you're looking at, what question you ask. All right. Well, we'll definitely look forward to that. So we'll do one more question. There are a lot of questions, Rob. I think what I'll do is I'll send you an email with uh, other questions and and perhaps you can get back to the the audience. Um, Beyond mGlu, have you also explored NAV 1.7 and or 1.8 in your human DRGs? Are these still functional and excised human DRGs? Uh, we have not done um, uh, those recordings ourselves. I think, yep. I think Antibios has we have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I can definitely say that um, we, we have uh, uh, NAV 1.7, 1.8 in the cultures, and, and we can push them in with, uh, you showed PGE, we can use bradykinin PGE to boost NAV 1.8 expression. Um, so um, I think that's it, Rob. Thank you so much for staying late. Uh, an excellent presentation. Uh, just a reminder to everyone in the audience, um, if you uh, would like to go back to our library, you can go to our website and uh, view on demand previous webinars or even look at this one again. Um, thanks to my colleague, Gary Watkins, uh, Director of Marketing for putting this together. Thank you all for attending. Uh, Rob, thanks again for your time. And uh, we look forward to seeing more great things from your lab. Thanks, my pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now.